economically, we are making a lot of strides, but uh, being somebody who's working in the education sector, uh, this has been, uh, if I may say, rather uh, honestly, has been slide down. Uh, so, uh, can any one of you uh, can identify what this uh, picture, this uh, painting, tries to evaluate? Anyway, in the car. This is a mock-up of a famous painting by Salvador Dali called The Dream. But however, it's not actually drawn by Salvador Dali, but somebody who tried to do a copy of it and a bad one. Uh, it took me a while to figure out that what this artist was trying to do. So I think this is exactly the situation that we actually have in, situ uh, in the domain of fundamental science in Bangladesh. Okay, uh, and it's been a while that we actually have had our lunch, so let me try to make you feel hungry by anything else. Can anyone identify what these things are? Potatoes, right? So they come in different variety and uh, shapes, sizes, color, etc. There's a story behind it. Uh, this is a artist impression of the Great Irish Famine, which took place uh, between 1845 and 1854. This is something that actually went on for like five to six years. And the reason behind was that uh, Ireland, at that time, you know, I mean, the, the, there was uh, all across Europe, they actually had this uh, potato blight, which is a disease which makes the potato rot. But the reason behind it was basically there was only one species of potato that was actually cultivated all across Ireland, and when this disease got to those species of potato, they were all basically were rotten away, and people didn't have anything better to eat on. There's a story here, I mean, there's a lesson in this uh, story, which is that if you put all your, all your eggs in the same basket, you can guess what happens. This is indeed what actually happens. So what happened, what I'm trying to imply, that when, this is an IUT, I mean, students study engineering. So all of you study engineering, or all of you become doctor, and you are actually coming across a new kind of situation. How do you actually address this thing? And this is why one needs to actually invest in fundamental research. And uh, I'm not sure because I was not present during the talks that actually took place in the morning, but I guess uh, Dr. Devon might have mentioned that, that we are actually up on the age of fourth industrial revolution, 4IR. And uh, one of the problems that I can foresee as an educator is that we are actually have new challenges and if you just believe that you will be actually pulling things out of the internet and present it to your customers, this will not cut it. Okay, uh, can anyone identify? I mean, I know there are two engineers among the crowd. So can you please identify what this is? A louder, please. Sorry? Tabla. <laughs> I, I mentioned electrical engineering, but okay, you ought to know this. <laughs> this is the first transformer that was constructed by Michael Faraday. The reason I mention this, I mean, these days when you actually make transformers, you see wires that actually insert wires that actually turn it around a long iron core, right? But at that time, insert wires did not exist. So you know what Michael Faraday did? He took his wife's petticoat and cut it in long strips and moved it around that. So this is how you do fundamental research. When you come across a new situation, you innovate. That does not exist. And coming back to, since we're talking about Faraday, there's something else I'd like to mention. It is an apocryphal story because uh, I tried to dig it uh, behind the origin of the story. I was not able to find it. But the story goes, when Gladstone was the exchequer, of the chancellor of the exchequer, he uh, finally had applied for certain grants. So he came to Faraday's lab and asked, what is this good for, this electricity? So when uh, Faraday said, I don't know, Mr. Preston, all I know that you will be able to tax it something. So this is one of the reasons why you should actually uh, do fundamental research, because you are not sure what you're getting at, but sooner or later this will actually come 
and come into some kind of uh, application later on. If you already know that what things are good for, then there's no point of doing research on it in the first place. Okay. Uh, so you, as uh, uh, in, uh, during the introduction, somebody had mentioned, I am affiliated with CERN. Actually, I work for a collaboration which is called Alice, one of the big four collaborations that actually are in LHC in CERN. And this is uh, something I'm going to come to. Uh, Bangladesh is a populous country, all of you know that. So, I mean, I'm pretty sure you know what's the percentage uh, of Bangladesh population in the world population. What's the percentage? The numbers up there, can you see it? It is 2.19, 2.2%. So if you're working at these days, as uh, Zara Mahmoud had mentioned just previously, that you actually have collaborative people, you have to actually bring in everything to get everybody together. So if that is the case, I would like to show you an example of this. This is a photograph of one of the second largest collaboration that we have in CERN, which goes by the name of CMS. CMS has actually around uh, 7,000 people working on it at the time. But this is a small intervention. We don't have 7,000 people. But can anybody find, can any of you can find a Bangladeshi among this collaboration or not? Can you find one of these faces? Somebody who holds a Bangladeshi passport and goes there. The answer is none. So, if you think that Bangladesh actually represents 2.2% of the world population and you have like 7,000 people here, please do the numbers. How many Bangladeshi should we actually have working in this collaboration right now? Do the math. 140. And as we speak, the number is zero. So that doesn't say very well about us. One of the reasons you might say, why should we actually get involved with this sort of research in the first place? Well, I can tell you. I mean, why do you actually go to a doctor? The doctor actually tells you, hey, get your MRI done. Why don't you actually go and get a CAT scan? Why don't you actually use uh, some different type of technology that you use these days, like your uh, cell phone? The screen on your cell phone, do you have any idea where that originally that innovation came from? That actually came from tracking particles. As far as those MRI is concerned, that past tense is concerned, the way you actually do the images is actually coming from all these activities in CERN. And this touch phone that you're actually dealing, the touch screen, that actually comes also from developing certain panels for the CERN experiments. So this is how you see if you in fundamental experiments, fundamental sciences, the kickback actually comes much later. Just like I had mentioned about Faraday's thing. Faraday's uh, experiment took place around 1830s, and you start using it after 100 years, and everything that we use these days is actually based on these experiments. At that time, he had no idea what it was good for, and he just had this quick read of mind, so that he went back to the bathroom and tell, hey, you can tax it. I mean, I can try to sell these ideas to politicians, but actually, these days, politicians are smarter people. They do not buy these sort of things anymore. Here's another picture. I have made it deliberately bloody. Can anyone tell me how many people from Bangladesh are in here? Looks like Bangladesh people, right? Look at the background. Close, but wrong. This is all our Indians who actually work for the LIGO collaboration. LIGO, as you know, I mean, a few years back, people had detected gyro waves. India also had a sub-project under it, and this is the number of all the Indians that are actually working there. So you see, our neighbor actually had made long strides, and where we are actually trailing behind a lot. This is not good. You might say, what good fundamental research is for, but I don't think I have made a case for it, and why you should invest in it. Now, whenever you talk to people from our universities, we keep on telling that we had SM Dose, the, bag, the person on the, uh, I actually have this problem left and right, so this is left, okay? And the person on the right happens to be Emma Saha. Emma Saha was actually born in Sabah, not too far away from here, okay? And there's a story that I'd like to tell you, which is when they were the students in Calcutta, okay, they actually were translating the Einstein's lectures on general relativity in 1916. And you might not believe it, that was the first English translation of Einstein's work on general relativity. So you see, 
Back in 1916, people from this region were way ahead of others in terms of keeping abreast of what was happening abroad. But 100 years down the line, we are trailing behind in everything. And if you think about it, uh, in the future, when you want to actually compete with people, you are aware of what we call is knowledge-based economy. I'm pretty sure, uh, Zara, you during your MBA, you must have come across this word knowledge-based economy a lot. But you, these days, we do not talk about knowledge-based economy anymore. We say knowledge-based industry. The industry exists now. Trade expert, you are also also one of them. Okay. Now, if you want to build such things, you need to actually have brains. We do have some of the brains sitting over here. And one of the best ones that we actually managed to find comes through different causes. For example, in terms of finding brains that work with science, the science Olympiad had been a very important thing. I mean, as you know, Bangladesh had been investing in like the science Olympiads like physics, math, and we also have great achievements. Dr. Devon is here. He actually has been mentored the uh, robotics team, and I'm proud to say that they actually had achieved gold very fast and very quickly compared to the math Olympiad or physics Olympiad. I did the physics Olympiad. Our best achievement had been in silver. But if I ask them how many of them are actually contributing back to the development of our sciences and technologies in the country, the answer, if I'm not mistaken, is zero. Why? Because all these people are actually living for abroad, which is not a good sign. I mean, it's not that every day you have people like Navi coming back to the country, right? So we actually have to build up some kind of framework where these students can come back and work, or we can develop them locally. So for this, uh, I propose, not I propose, we actually have an idea, which is we should, just like in India, just like in Pakistan, we should actually have some framework where we, the people with this kind of background can be put in together. So I actually present this by this picture of the call room. And one of the important things that my experience tells me that government actually wants to, the rest of government at the government is got the funding can be coming from the private sector, Public obviously is there, but the important thing that we need to actually have some kind of commitment that budget or have we lost no uh, budget or you have some kind of fund allocation, fund generation for this sort of uh, institutions that we actually plan to build up. In fact, uh, the national talent hunt for this sort of things that we propose and that actually already the, the Olympiads does this job for us already. However, uh, we get the students in the Olympiad state, but after that what happens, we do not keep track of them because most of them actually end up going abroad. But it's not that all of them have. I am pretty sure there are people over here in IoT who actually have been past participants in what each of these uh, science Olympiads. And the such exactly the same sort of uh, framework actually exists in our sports. Because if you think about it, the under-19 team, the under-23 team, these sort of teams that actually, where they actually get trained, they get trained from BKSP. I mean, for example, Mushfiq Rahim, then Safi Hassan, all these people actually were uh, alumnus, if I may use the word, of uh, BKSP. But such analogous institution doesn't exist for training people. You might say that universities exist, but as you know, universities are actually are not keeping up with the pace of uh, what the development is taking place abroad. I mean, the, in my state, if, if I, you were to ask me that what picture do you have when you talk about these institutions, the picture I have in mind is brontosaurus. Because brontosaurus are big, but they are slow moving. What we need in a fast changing time, we need our institution speed, just like Velocidapters. Small, fast, quick, and efficient. And uh, the most important missing piece, because this is something was in the pipeline, in the work with some friends of mine, uh, you might be aware of uh, Mahmoud Mujunda, who's actually in RAC. Uh, we had actually been thinking that we should actually set up an institution where something like similar to like TIFA or like ICTS, which exists in India, uh, such setup could be made. However, the important thing is you need to have resident mentors, teachers who decide over there 
and look after this case. Unless we take this step very soon, soon we will be start staring at a desert as far as the fundamental research is concerned. There are, I mean, among the speakers here and also I'm pretty sure the attendees, there are people who are, uh, have affiliations with funding agencies, private, public, whatever, but I think it's a very high time that you start thinking also funding in fundamental research because you will reap your benefits, not now, I can guarantee you 20 years will reap the benefits. Thank you.